um, we're going to shift now and hear our feature reader, Kim Goldberg. Uh, she's the author of eight books of poetry uh, and nonfiction. Her surreal and absurdist poems and fables have appeared in magazines and anthologies in North America and abroad. Her first poetry collection, Ride Backwards on Dragon, was shortlisted for the Gerald Lampart Memorial Award. And Red Zone, a collection of poems on urban homelessness, has been taught in university literature courses. Um, in 2016, she released Undetectable, her high boom journey through a lifetime of hepatitis C. So lots of interesting stuff she's written. Her earlier nonfiction books were published by New Star Books and Harbor Publishing. She holds a degree in biology from the University of Oregon, Oregon, not Oregon, that'd be interesting, eh? The University of Oregon, the University <laughs> of Oregon, and is an avid bird watcher and field naturalist. Before turning to poetry, she was a freelance journalist covering environmental issues in all kinds of publications from Canadian Geographic to this magazine to Georgia Strait to Columbia Journalism Review to BBC Wildlife a Magazine and others. Uh, she came to Canada in 1970, I'm assuming as a fairly young person, as part of the Vietnam War resistors heading north. She lives on unceded Sunamu. Uh, Did I get that right? I hope so. Sunamu. I was, Michelle helped me out with that one. Uh, where she is known for creating poem galleries and vacant storefronts and staging guerrilla happenings in weedy waysides. So let's welcome Kim Goldberg. I will mute everyone because I don't have to switch back and forth constantly. So okay. And then I'm going to unmute Kim. There we go. Kim, you'll have to unmute yourself. Apparently, you. There we go. Okay. So we're good to go, are we? Excellent. Uh, all righty. Well, thank you very much, Daniel and Zoe and all of Planet Earth Poetry for having me here tonight. This actually turns out to be the launch of my book, Devolution, new book, that, yes, yay, because it came out in March, uh, really right before lockdown began. So, of course, I had many launches planned and lined up up and down the island and over on the mainland, but that all fell apart. And so this, this is my first public presentation of this book. So thank you very much for that. How, how is my audio level? Everybody good on the audio? Okay, because this will probably be my reading voice, my reading volume. Uh, so devolution, I call it uh, poems and fables, satiric poems and fables about ecopocalypse or ecotastrophe, or sometimes I just say the end of the world. Now I realize that sounds a little gloomy, but for whatever reason, in fact it sounds very gloomy, but for whatever reason, the more dilapidated the whole condition of the planet has been getting, both ecologically and in terms of political breakdown and societal breakdown, and this has been in recent years, unfortunately, sort of mapped against a breakdown in my own body, a rather severe health collapse, all of this, this tragedy and trauma is getting filtered through my brain and coming out as absurdism. So the worse the situation in the outer world and within my own body got, the more ridiculous all of my stories and poems became. And somehow that knit together and formed devolution. So I'm gonna probably, say more about that as we go on, but I'm going to start with Atlantis, which is actually the first poem in the book. Atlantis. In the lost city of Atlantis, we drift from god to god. The animals on display have slipped their feathered cages and gilt chains. The big top sits empty, not even a flea in the matchbox seats. It was tricky at first, a skid through marbles on the curve, the swifts departed in ash plumes, rising from the lacerated rim of our existence. They took the night with them. We now know through inductive reasoning and computer simulations that the swifts were the night, and with night comes sleep, and with sleep, dreams. You see where this narrative of privation is leading. Wait, there, behind a goat-shaped cloud, I think I see another god. So that's Atlantis. 
Uh, the next one I'm going to share, I'm wondering why I can't get my face to be the one I'm looking at on my screen. Oh, well, we'll just, we won't worry about the mechanics of this. We're just going to keep going. <laughs> the next one I want to share is called Spawn. Now, people probably remember, I wrote this in 2011. I've been working on the poems in devolution for about 10 years. And the last four of those years is when my own health had just sort of like fell off a cliff and just kept falling further and further. But happy to say that I'm currently in remission on all fronts. So yay, that's as good as you can get. But things got pretty wild and wacky as the uh, the poetry just filtered out and helped me process through ridiculousness uh, what was the enormity of what was going on. So in 2011, people probably remember it was the year of the Fukushima uh, meltdown nuclear disaster in Japan, both a meltdown and an explosion releasing quite a bit of radioactive material both into the ocean and into the atmosphere. All of this material was scheduled on a precise date to reach the west coast of North America, including our shores, and at it, it, that date also coincided with a phenomenal natural phenomenon, the peak of the herring spawn. So the confluence of these two things, this radioactive cloud and the peak of the herring spawn, um, formed itself into this poem, Spawn, which is written as uh, a loose palindrome when I wrote it up on a beach in Parksville watching the, the herring spawn. Under the bluest sky of the year, I stood at the edge of my world and watched the flicker flashing churn of brimming life, the sea gone white with sperm, the stench and smoky spew of diesel powered winches winding in their nets, beating out the fish, I watched the shooting stars cascade into the darkened hold to be later stripped of roe for Japanese markets. The yawning emptiness between electrons in the salty air, packed tight today with sirens wail and swaggling song from 4,000 gulls and brant, aloft beyond the endless snowy drift of milk, whipped thick and scattered into bands of froth along a tide line with no vanishing point at all. All of this on the same day that the radioactive cloud from Japan's nuclear disaster was scheduled to reach our shore. All of us together in this self-made retroactive cloud with no vanishing point at all. We tipped and scattered clamshells in the froth, our lifeline lost beyond the endless rip leaving molten rock and magma from 4,000 songs and plants. The salty air packed tight today with sirens wail in Japanese markets, while the yawning emptiness of our elections echoes in a darkened hold to be later stripped and sold as fish bait. We watched the shooting stars cascade into a diesel-flowered meadow, binding all our heads, beating while it burned until the stench and smoky spew was traded for the flicker flash of atomic churn, and the sea was gone under the bluest sky of the year as we stood at the edge of our world. So that's, thank you, that's uh, Spawn. This one, um, I guess we're going to go on a little bit different direction. This one is staging. Now, staging can mean multiple things. Uh, staging, of course, can refer to uh, a theatrical, staging a theatrical or dramatic performance of some sort, or I suppose it could even, in modern parlance, refer to staging a home for real estate showing and sale. It can also, however, have a, a meaning in cancer and a cancer diagnosis. So um, <clears throat> what we have going on here is basically my adivan fueled hallucination while in an MRI tube. And this is my documentation of it for this staging process. The opera had gone on far too long. The audience came and went as needed for sandwiches, hip replacements, jail sentences, but it was glorious 
serious. I composed it myself and was performing it with the koalas high in the eucalyptus forest. The orchestra smashed metal plates with the ferocity of dueling moon rovers. My lyrics were inscrutable without the universal translator, yet our harmonies were skeins of silver geese reaching all the way to Cassiopeia's left eye. The finale was perhaps too abrupt, all the reviewers mentioned this, when they slid me out of my oven casing on a steel rail, fully baked with golden puff pastry nicely crusted on my torso, I could still taste the sweet warmth of the koala's eucalyptus breath. And that's all the true story. Yes, that's the way it went. Uh, so this is threes and probably needs no setup. Threes, number one. Three men, <laughs> three men by the corn dog cart take to the sky as crows. Their business suits and patent leather loafers become black feathers and claw feet as they loft into the blue. There are three briefcases, now dark maws stretched wide with sound and meteorology. The landlocked people feel a momentary warm breath of wing beats as they reach for the ketchup and then nothing. Two. Three men in a rowboat fight over two oars until they knock a hole in the floorboards and an octopus scuttles in. The men are outarmed, but the octopus knows the destination, so the hostile takeover is for the best. The creature rows all night with two arms and clasps the three men in an adhesive embrace with the other six. By morning, they clear the birth canal. The exhausted octopus deposits her naked squealing cargo on the beach. And number three, three men in a boardroom, 30 stories high, discuss double hulled tankers while they race small islands from marine charts. In a hiccup in their hearts, leaps from three throats and bangs its head against the triple glazed window, trying to see all 30 stories at once. Um, you know, I should say most of these are either free verse poems or formed poems, but there are some prose poems and even, although I'm not reading them tonight, what would actually be uh, short stories in here as well. And so I called the collection Poems and Fables. And uh, many of the poems, even if they're written free verse, are fairly narrative. Um, that just seemed to be mainly what I was aiming for with this book. This is, uh, this next one is Somewhere a Creature, and it's a sonnet that I wrote about Nanaimo's Tent City, which was up in 2018 for at least uh, six months. There were hundreds of people were living in this tent city in Nanaimo. In fact, I think at one point Nanaimo's Tent City was the biggest tent city in all of BC. Uh, there were at least 450 people there at the peak of it. So, and it was in a downtown, unused industrial wasteland, sort of, adjoining rail yard and across the street from a downtown Nanaimo shopping mall. Uh, called Dis And the tent city, the people there called it Discontent City. And so I wrote this poem on the eve of um, a showdown the next day that was, had been planned and announced by a, a right-wing um, hate group called Soldiers of Odin. They were quite prominent during Nanaimo's Tent City in 2018. Upon the planet's stony hide, unloved, or sandstorms scour bones to piles of chalk, a kaleidoscopic rash of domes erupts, passing sensors swivel, rumble, gawk. Each hemisphere a mystery inside, bauble, beast, arcane chemistry. To look would alter flow of sun and tide. The world's a wobble with uncertainty. Beside one dome, a gun grows abundant. Beside another, knives do claim some flesh. There's talk of secret springs, an end to hunger. Somewhere, a creature slips its master's leash. Once the drift toward meaning has begun, it is a thing can never be undone. 
Um, this next poem, you know, I wasn't even going to put that poem in somewhere a creature. I just hadn't thought of it for quite a while. And I also hadn't thought of soldiers of Odin in quite a while, because while they were prominent in Nanaimo when Ten City was going on two years ago in 2018, and two of them actually ran that year for seats on Nanaimo City Council, actually not getting elected, which is just as well since they are a hate group of some notoriety internationally. Um, but then they had disappeared. Soldiers of, dis of, of Odin had disappeared from the landscape and from most of our minds until this morning, when one of them began posting on the Facebook event for the Black Lives Matter rally that was happening this afternoon in Nanaimo. So that seemed like a bad scene and it put them back in my mind and put this poem in the whole episode of Nanaimo 10 City back in my mind, which is how I came to include that poem tonight. Uh, this next poem is Cape. It's a short eight-line trio lay, and I should say, since I've got a number of formed poems in here, a sonnet, a trio lay, palindrome, uh, we all owe, uh, all of us poets owe a great deal to the anthology In Fine Form, edited by Kate Braid and Sandy Shreve. I mean, I'm pretty sure most of the people here know what book I'm talking about, and I think we have a lot more formed poetry being written as a result of that book, and many people getting turned on to for so-called formed poetry, poetry written in form, often forms that are centuries old. So, um, and so, and the book is just an excellent source of inspiration in general. You know, you can sit out in the backyard, read a few poems, and boom, before you know it, you're writing something usually in form. So this is a triolet cake. Lost in an alley, we sought our gods, stowed our bunt pans in gravel burrows, sweet keepsakes from an earlier epoch. Tossed in an alley, we caught our gods, shifting numbers to hide the curvature of thought. When the bubble burst, the moths turned gold, but we lost the alley, defrauded by gods, who stowed our bunt pans in gravel burrows. Some of these things, it's best to just not ask too much what they mean. I, even I don't know, but some of them. Uh, the Old Woman in the Sea. This one, I wrote this in 20, uh, 2017, three years ago, the morning after Trump announced that he was pulling the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Now, I think that decision was subsequently, thank goodness, turned around. But, you know, it all just seems so dire and like just one bad thing after another. So this uh, was written on the heels of that. The Old Woman in the Sea. Somewhere beyond silent streets and woodlands, beyond upheaved graveyards, empty schools, dry spillways, vacant hibernaculums for little brown bats, beyond the last larval food plant of the last western tiger swallowtail, an old woman sits by the sea, untangling the nets of each life she can recall from the time before. Her cabin above the tide line is sparse as birdsong in the northwest squall. She cooks over a burn barrel beside her shack, stokes it with driftwood and whatever tumbles ashore. Once an old door made a landing, then a desk still intact. She grills any scrap of flesh the sea hacks up, bull kelp, moon jellies, three-eyed eels, eats them with succulent stems of glasswort growing in the sand. When evening comes, she flings each newly sorted net upon the ocean like a bedsheet, for each is a piece of the planetary genome. She is waiting for the nets to find one another, reconnect end to end, spiral beneath the waves, replicate. But each net returns alone, an enfolded mass of knot, bone, chitinous exoskeleton, bloated elongate bodies of the unknown. So obviously I was feeling a little dismal on that morning after, you know, the bad climate accord news, but uh, that's, that's the way poetry takes you where it takes you. So I somehow feel this wouldn't be complete if I didn't share the title poem to this book, Devolution. 
But this is the one poem that I really have the least idea of what it means or what it's about. So we're just going to have to go with it. It came from somewhere and we'll just have to trust that, trust the universe on that. <clears throat> Devolution. You were sitting on the stars. I didn't notice you at first. I was skipping the moons of Jupiter across eternity's black hiss. You sat very still and in the shadow of a large dog's last breath, just smoking a cigarette and watching me skip moons. Each ripple was the raspy alarm call of a canyon wren trapped in the geologic grip of moons becoming stones, becoming sand, becoming beach glass, becoming a coral reef, becoming bleached muslin in the electrostatic waters recede, exposing single-celled life to the face of complexity. I liked the grating sound of live wires unbraiding themselves until the moons ran out. And that's when I turned and saw you, saw the orange tip of your cigarette as you took a long drag. You flicked it aside and it became another star. Want to see something cherry bent Faraday, you asked? What does that even mean, I said. No fun if I tell you, follow me. So I did, past the shrunken nebula and the palace of historic eyebrow gestures, and finally the swale of decomposing art that no one understood. That's when you showed me the burial caves deep in your body. You led me on hands and knees. By the end, we had to belly crawl. When we reached the wall of bells, we had become centipedes out of necessity. The bells were bird cages, housing creatures we couldn't see. Flash of feather, a furry arm reaching out from underneath, curling over brass skirt, golden eyes blinking in dark cavities. The bells spoke, trying to convince us of something. Their tone was urgent, but I could not grasp the meaning. They all yammered at once and in a dead language. Their yearning was a hot plate beneath my hundred feet. Soon I had 100 corn tortillas. I decided to open a taco truck. It was an unmet niche market in the burial caves gastronomy. You were watching me again and smoking another cigarette. Um, I'm going to... <laughs> <laughs> that was devolution, the title poem, so it must mean something. Um, I'm going to move off of devolution for a moment and share a pandemic poem, a more recently written poem. I'm sure pretty much all of us here who are poets have probably written at least one pandemic poem, if not a whole bunch of them, during the last three months of what's been going on. Uh, this one I wrote on March 21st, which was World Poetry Day, and I had very strategically selected that day to be the day of my book launch scheduled for Nanaimo Public Library. Yay, let's launch on World Poetry Day, great tie-in. But of course, when that day rolled around, not only was it totally inappropriate and ill-advised to hold an actual real life in the flesh public gathering, but all the libraries had closed because of that. So, so I found myself roaming the streets of South Bend Nanaimo, which is Nanaimo's oldest neighborhood. Many or some of the homes there are over a hundred years old, dating back to the original coal mining era and period of Nanaimo. And it's usually a bustling residential neighborhood, but was completely deserted. All of the streets, I didn't see another human being. And so I came to write this poem, Dead Town, a pantoum, written as a pantoum. I was writing the poem as I was supposed to be launching the evolution. As I walked through Dead Town this morning, I saw an archangel drop from a guy wire, securing the universe against untimely collapse. This morning I saw an archangel on the train tracks where wheels no longer grind the universe into untimely collapse. Why are feathers white on the underside? On the train tracks, where wheels no longer grind, two homeless men have set up camp. Why are feathers white on the underside, they ask, as they roast the electrocuted pigeon. Two homeless men have set up camp and must live the metaphor of self-isolation. They ask the electrocuted pigeon they are roasting for its consent. It agrees to being sacrificed. 
we must live the metaphor of self-isolation. There are only 14 nosegays in dead town. Who among us will consent to being sacrificed when 900 nosegays are needed for the parade? There are only 14 nosegays in dead town. Where is the savior who can pass her palm o'er the land and conjure the 900 nosegays needed for the parade? Where is the florist who will die trying? Where is the savior who can pass her hand o'er the land? Did she drop from a guy wire securing the florist who will die trying? Dare I walk through dead town? Uh, I just got a couple more that I was going to share here. This is a short one and also another triolet, another eight line triolet. Uh, this one is called Arrival and I wrote it two years ago for Literary Review of Canada for their January 2018 issue, which was focusing on Canada's 150th anniversary of Confederation. However, poets wanted to interpret that either as a celebration or a condemnation or anything in between. So this is Arrival. A land where wolves did howl till dawn where muskrats wove each home from reeds. I don't know why the bees have gone, have never heard a wolf at dawn. The beaver's tail does sound alarm. No squash will grow from last year's seeds on land where wheels now howl till dawn and townhomes rise where once stood reeds. And uh, yes, as you can see with some of the formed poems, like a triolet, that one, it only has eight lines. And by part of the rules of the form, uh, most of those lines repeat somewhere in the poem. So you don't really have a lot of material to work with. And so often the trick in a poem like that is how do you keep it interesting? And so we'll use little word shifts to just slightly alter the meaning of the line the second time through um, are often the way to do that. Whether it's successful or not in my attempts remains to be seen, but I'm going to close, I think, with this uh, poem, which comes very near the end of the book and so is appropriate at the end here, shortly before the end. This is a prose poem. Shortly before the end, their minds turned sleek and black and were last seen bobbing and diving among small open fish boats in the harbor. The golden light scattered diamonds atop the sea whenever a lean mind broke the surface. Each mind had a tight band around its neck and a string on one leg. This allowed it to continue searching and biting down on anything slippery it might encounter while scouring the murky depths. But the collar prevented the mind from assimilating its catch thus rendering each mind into an immaculate, self-propelled satchel that was relieved of its still squirming bounty by a higher power every time it bobbed to the surface and the string was reeled in. By afternoon, the collars were removed and the ravenous minds were allowed to eat just enough of their catch to remain conscious and nourish brain cells. Then they were shut away in wicker crates until the following day. Thank you very much. I'm going to leave it there. Hey, let's hear it first. Thank you very much. I Thank sort of.